He may turn from whatever distances us from you. You may follow the things that sustain our life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Well, regardless of the church needs to be 
While Moses is on Mount Sinai, people grow restless and make a golden calf for worship. Today's reading shows Moses as a mediator between an angry God and a sinful people. Moses reminds God that the Israelites are God's own people and boldly asks mercy for them. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down there at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They've been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. They said, Please are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, this people, and how stiff necked they are. Now, let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them with the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring this as to any people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Would you read with me responsibly the psalm? Uh, your part would be the whole part. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love and your great compassion. Blot out my offenses. Wash me through your For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner away from my mother's womb. Cited as evidence that even the most unworthy may become witnesses to the grace of God. A reading from Paul's first letter to Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I receive mercy, so that in me, as in the foremost, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Over the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Please rise for reading the gospel.
with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can see. Your friends may ask refreshment and grace come upon you with call today. Call today homecoming Sunday for several reasons, none of which are particularly because of today's appointed uh, readings from the Bible, but I'll admit that I don't feel very much at home with the images of sheep and shepherds. I mean, it's probably only because I've spent a lot of years in a Christian fellowship that I got used to these uh, images, these ideas of, of uh, Jesus being the good shepherd. The Gospel tells us he was the son of a carpenter, incidentally. So, and the picture language of, of shepherds is something that he used not because he was one or had been a shepherd, but because of the culture in which it was a familiar picture language that he could refer to. King David may have been a shepherd, but not Jesus. So perhaps we're all okay with this picture language because we can imagine at least that, that close relationship of shepherd and sheep and the, the importance of keeping a flock together. But I wanted to explore other images of what it means to keep a people together, a community, uh, all as one people. Traveling out uh, way north to Hazlitt Canyon yesterday to see Father Hans, uh, I took with me Bishop Robert Clement and I asked him in the car about his long life. He admitted that he's always been a bit of a wanderer or, a, or an adventurer from his very earliest days. He grew up in a, a good home in northeastern Pennsylvania, yet it was a small town and it was, you know, small town ways that could be very stifling and boring, so he was always looking for some minor mischief to get into. And one story he told me uh, from when he was about five years old kind of stuck with me. Young Clement apparently already knew his way around this little town and he encouraged another little friend of his to hang with him as they walked home the long way. So they purposely took a right turn when they should have taken a left turn and did quite a circuit of the town. Well, they were gone for several hours and their parents began to get concerned. Adults went out looking for them. And when little Robert finally came home on his own, his parents rejoiced that he was okay, that he was home, and that nothing bad had happened to their little boy. But when his friend got to his home, his parents acted very different. He got a spanking. And sadly, the bishop said that was the last time that they ever did anything fun together. Well, I guess we know what the parents thought. Maybe this explains why many people don't associate the, the church with homecoming. If this is God's house, then to, to people who want to stay away from God, who are afraid of God, this would be the last place that they would want to come to for fear they would get another spanking in the house of God. Candy, our, our waitress friend, who used to work at the French marketplace in West Hollywood, said that she was, we got to chatting one night over for our meal and she brought things in, uh, and invited the church and all those kinds of things. And she said, oh no, I could never, if I even darken the door of a church, I'm sure the thunderbolt will come right down and that would be the end of my life. Michelle Alexander, who I mentioned before, an African-American uh, civil rights attorney, talks about 
about an entire class of people in America who she feels are not welcome in most African American churches. It's the black men who have done time, They've come out of criminal justice, and they are ex offenders and not welcome to come home. Churches have spent so much energy obsessing about wrongdoing that they often seem to have nothing left to say that's right or that's welcoming or embracing or, or caring or loving. And for the clergy, this is a, a real dilemma. We, we've inherited this, this Latin word for us as pastor, which means shepherd. And we utilize the language of the flock as if it's our profession to gather a flock of people. We're usually charged with the job of tracking down those who wander in the hopes that they will return. But perhaps we don't realize that if the sheepfold is the church, we're trying to gather in the very ones who are repelled by what the church has done to them. Because we also have uh, been a part of the system that administers a spanking to those who do come. A scolding or a shaming of those who somehow fail to behave as they were expected to. In the Gospel reading this morning, there are these twin parables which Jesus tells to those who criticize him for always being with the outsiders, the people on the margins of society, the folks who didn't behave as they were supposed to. And just a sidelight, the word that's used here says he eats with sinners. Uh, the word that's used there refers to non-practicing Jews, people who just didn't even pay attention to all that religious stuff. And so they were called sinners. So he tells these parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we think, you know, we're familiar enough with these old stories. And, and one thing, though, I think is often overlooked. Uh, you don't notice until you take them together as we have to look at them both together and see that they are meant to uh, offer parallels. The one has sheep, uh, sheep that's wandered, and the coin has apparently rolled out of sight, under something, I guess. But the parable is not about the sheep, but about the shepherd. The parable is not about the coin, it's about the woman who found it. What I'm saying is that to Jesus, it's not important what bad thing the shepherd did to get itself lost. It's just lost, and the shepherd seeks the sheep. And then to illustrate that, Jesus mentions this, this round coin. Most people and sheep wander off willfully instead of going straight home, but coins can hardly be blamed rolling away. I mean, it's not the coin's fault. So by putting these two parables together, Jesus is not saying a word about the behavior of the sheep or the behavior of the coin. Instead, the story is about the persistence of the one who seeks the loss. The woman rejoices that she has found her coin. The shepherd rejoices when the lamb is able to come home on the shoulder. Just so Jesus there is rejoicing in him. God rejoices whenever anyone comes home. It's pointless then to, to imagine that the shepherd is going to spank the sheep for having wandered off. I mean, that's kind of stupid. And it, it's really absurd, isn't it, to think of the woman spanking her sinful coin because it rolled under the bed or something. Why then do we spend so much worry and time and energy imagining that the, the God who made us is waiting with a big switch or a thick leather belt to give us a severe spanking if we come home. It just doesn't fit with us. Well, perhaps I'm, I'm risking the reputation of being a, a purveyor of cheap grace or something, but, but I believe the mission of the church has changed. We don't live in a Christian society any longer where, where it's up to the preachers to act like gatekeepers or corral the sheep, or, or separate the sheep from the goats, or dispense steely glances at, at the black sheep of the family. There are so many people out there today who have no history, absolutely no history with the church, no exposure to the experience or the, the ideas and expressions that we use when we talk about God's grace. They are so disconnected from it that that a homecoming to the church means absolutely nothing. Yet as we look at all the people in our lives, our neighbors and friends and, and acquaintances, we can clearly see that some people, maybe a lot of people, are looking for home, aren't they? They're looking for a, 
a deeper sense of, of their lives and, and their place in this world. They're looking for safety and, and completeness that society doesn't offer to them. They work hard, but they don't feel at home in their jobs. They play hard, but recreation is just diversion. They go shopping and run a credit card bill, but, but that's filling up an emptiness that can't be filled by shopping. And they, uh, they sometimes fall in love over and over again, fall out of love, and spend their whole lives feeling like somehow either they're alone or in divorce court and that life has escaped. What I'm observing is, is that there's a human restlessness, which is more and more obviously a, a spiritual homelessness. And it, it is our place as faithful Christians. If we're at home in a community, it's our place to take down the barriers and open the doors and turn on the lights and to practice spiritual hospitality. I mean, we have it in a physical way. We've done a lot of that in this congregation. Welcome home used to be impossible for many when the church doors were at the top of a high set of steps that you couldn't climb if you were handy. We fixed it. Welcome home was impossible when white churches made it real clear that, that black people weren't welcome because their cultural expectations or, or preferences were so different. We welcomed everyone. Finding a home was difficult for ex-offenders if they walked in and heard nothing but judgment or criticism and warnings. And it's the same thing for, for gay and lesbian people. If all they heard was damnation and threats, it wasn't home. And a home as a church is still difficult for those who are literally homeless, who may have worn out their welcome on a friend's sofa, maybe worn out their sneakers staying on the streets. But they, they discover that too many Christians have so many expectations that they just can't meet. This is why I'm trying on a, a, a new picture language, like, like trying on a, a new suit of clothes, if you will. I'm thinking especially of men in our society who think the church is not for them. It's, it's too uh, soppy and sentimental and they don't see Jesus as an action Men are famous for not asking for directions from the walls. They won't even unfold the road map because that might, you know, lose face. So there's, there's no sense putting a bumper sticker on your car that says Jesus is God, read the Bible. They're not going to do it. They won't read it. We are perhaps only that filling station along the way of life. Where you can stop if you're really desperate. And we have really well-marked signs that anybody can read without being embarrassed or shamed for not knowing the way home. Our, our caution here, though, is that we can't just put up signs as an institution. Our well-marked signs for others have to be spiritual signs, not posters. We must be ourselves. We must be the signs of peace, of this, the, the signs of God's free grace, not just toleration or, or conditional acceptance. We must be ourselves, so full of God's love that we're, we're not signs of spiritual insecurity, but we become anchors of grace for those who need to find it. Landmarks and milestones on the way back. Now, does this mean that, that you and I have to be some kind of super Christian, you know, real, real religious to be evangelists out there? Well, no, as I've said on other occasions, I don't think the gospel of Christ demands of us that we be really religious. He invites us to be really genuine, to be really human, and not fun. We're not sent out to just talk about faith. If anything, it's better to be God's listeners, to be the ears for someone else to share what's on, what's on their mind. And if you think that you're just not prepared to, you know, be with somebody and offer a prayer out loud, then offer a hug out loud. Any kind of embrace that says, I'm there for you. And that's something we act out. It's not religious, it is the genuineness that moves hearts. And do it 
with the security and the comfort that you have a home in the presence of God, that you have a place of strength and, and a refuge that's here for you. Dick and Melody Tunney, who wrote today's choir, put this into words or something that could maybe help dial down the drama of people's lives or cut the chatter that's always in our heads or erase the terror of a God that we imagine, you know, that there's going to be thunderbolts ready to strike us. The sheep is not afraid of the shepherd after all. The coin is not cringing in fear of being found under the bed. So in the songwriter's words, addressed to God, it says, we don't always understand what your perfect will demands, but we learn to trust you more in your presence. In your presence there is comfort. In your presence there is peace. To understand our own anxiety, our own restlessness, only need to come to God. So the songwriters say to us, to be found in Him alone, all our deepest secrets know we're surrounded by His grace when we see His face. This can be your, this can be your peace. This can be a refuge for you where grace is amazing, where love is unconditional, where a hug is genuine and a smile.
the whole eternity, one God, the only sovereign, who dwells in light, Christ Jesus, who came to save sinners, and the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation.
Reconciling and forgiving God, pour out your mercy upon us when we stray into twisted paths or dead ends. Turn us back to you and fulfill your righteous covenant. God, in your mercy, bring your creative power to this earth again and restore what we have damaged or destroyed. Show mercy to those suffering and fearful in Colorado because of violent weather and raging waters. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Send your spirit of forgiveness and renewal to all homes, to families, communities, and nations. Reconcile us to one another as you have graciously reconciled us to you. And teach us the ways of peace and justice. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Give guidance to our leaders and to all nations that violence, cruelty, and genocide be turned back in Syria. Hold in your safety all who serve our nation, especially our loved ones, Alan, Tasha, and Steve, Chaplain David, Troy and Todd, Giovanni and John. God, in your mercy. Seek out those who struggle on their own with illness, despair, or fear. Especially we pray for those who cry out for those who are dear to us in this household. Gerald, recovering from surgery. Scott, suffering a setback. Mary Lou, struggling for life. Mary, Joyce, Ellie, and Mercy for strength and capacity. Susan, Karin, Kevin, and Sue for healing and strength. Father Hans for a secure home. Raul Sr. and Bert, Diane, Patty, Carol, Dolores, Rena, Ray, and William fighting cancer. And for Sharon, Diana, Bobby, Mario, Edward, Bob, and Brenda, Ruth Ann, and Patty for health and well being. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Make of this faith community a home for all who are lost or seeking a different life. Help us to bear their burdens and walk with them and lead them to hope in your strength. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Lead home those who are refugees from violence or catastrophes those who are displaced by changes beyond their control, and all who are homeless. Shelter them from all harm and reveal a new and promising life. God, in your mercy. Receive our prayer. Here other intercessions may be offered either aloud or in silence. Receive our prayer. Receive our prayer. Living God, your mercy transforms us. Speak to us through the lives of saints and witnesses, and use our lives to proclaim the healing power of your salvation. God, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Holy One, we entrust all for whom we pray, confident that you will keep us and hold us in Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our tithes and offerings will be received.
nourished and won to, to bear the fruits of your spirit in our lives. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. In simplicity and faith, we offer the prayer which our Lord Jesus has given to us. Our Father, Amen.
thanks again, O oh God, that in this speech the word makes our Lord. Amen. May our Lord's body and his precious blood which you have received strengthen you in faith and grant you grace for life. Amen. And may God Almighty send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you, the holy angels accompany you, and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now.